And grace and peace be yours in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk about a word that some people react against. The word is doctrine. Doctrine. Some people say, well, doctrine is boring. Doctrine is for some egg-headed nerd. Well, like you, Pastor, right? That's what people think about doctrine. Doctrine, by the way, they say worse. Doctrine's divisive. Why don't we all get along? Why don't we not fight about picayune things, right? Some people say, well, let the church do good deeds in the community and not worry about what it believes, teaches, and confesses. Deeds, not creeds, they say. In Connecticut, there was a social service agency in town. A lot like here, we have Sharing God's Love. They had one called Jericho Partnership. 25 churches were in that partnership. My church was in it. And they wanted to do good deeds in the community, but they wanted to make sure that it was clear that they were doing it in the name of Jesus. These are Christian churches working in the name of Jesus. And so the Jericho Partnership had a statement of faith, and they asked every partner church to sign that statement of faith. Believe it or not, there were a couple churches, Christian churches in town, who said, we could join the partnership if you would water down your statement of faith. Right? They thought doctrine was divisive. It was too particular about Jesus, they said. The partnership voted not to water down the statement of faith. Those churches did not join the partnership, which of course meant my church stayed in. We would have left had they changed it. Some people are offended by doctrine, but we need to be clear. What do we mean by doctrine? Doctrine just means the clear teaching of God's word. That's what it means, to teach rightly about God. We want to get this. There is a God, and he's spoken. That's the premise. There is a God, and he's spoken. More particularly, he's spoken in human language. When he speaks in language, what does that mean? We can read it. It's spoken in words and grammar and syntax matter. We read it. We understand it. We study it. How about this? We memorize it. Anybody remember that ancient concept of memory verses? I would commend to all of us to memorize more of scriptures. And if it can be understood, then I grow in my understanding. I learn. I consult wise scholars and what they think it says. How about this? How about if I internalize it and even apply it? Has God spoken? Yes, if he's spoken then I want to listen. Now, when we say God has spoken, that raises this question, is the Bible the word of God or is it from men? That's very foundational. We have to get it right out of the way because if the Bible is the word of men, what does that mean? That means we can pick and choose and are there churches that do that? Sure, there are churches that say, well, here's a verse in St. Paul. I don't like this verse. You know what? St. Paul's just wrong. Or here's a a verse in Peter, and Peter, well, it's kind of outdated. Peter lived a long time ago. We know better now. And so we start to say, I like this verse and not that one. Very often, people say to me, well, pastor, look where this church is. Look at the things that some churches practice now. And they think, how did they get there? Answer is, they gave up scriptural authority long ago, right? If the Bible's not the word of God, now we can pick which parts we like. If the Bible is the word of God, then what? Now the Bible is over us. We are here to receive that word, to study, to learn, to see what it has to say. The Bible is the word of God. Uh, If the Bible isn't the word of God, that makes me actually God over the text, right? But the Bible is the word of God. It's God's word to us. And so we read it and hear. Now, this other thing, not just to understand it as doctrinal, it is doctrinal, but to understand what does that doctrine mean to my life? Does the Bible speak to my life? How shall I live? How shall I see things? Right? My uh, former pastor of mine in Virginia used to say that lifestyle is doctrine lived out. I like that phrase to say, what does the Bible say about these things? And then what does the Bible say about whom I should marry? Does that make sense? What does the Bible say about what kinds of work I would do when I get to work? What kind of worker shall I be? How shall I treat the people around me? Does the Bible speak to these things? Yes, because doctrine isn't just abstract. Doctrine applies. So that's all introductory to say we've been in the book of 1 Timothy for several weeks now. uh, And the question is, does 1 Timothy talk about doctrine? The answer is yes. By the way, we didn't read uh, the first chapter because I started in chapter 2. Remember that controversial chapter 
I wanted to talk about it, but I want to go back a little bit and look at uh, Paul's urging, the letter from Paul to Timothy. Timothy's a pastor, a young pastor, and Paul is letting him know, I want you to pastor this church that, by the way, Paul himself had established. And 1 Timothy chapter 1, this is how it goes. First two verses are greetings, right? Paul greets Timothy. The very first verse after the greeting is 1 Timothy 1 verse 3, which says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Does doctrine matter? <laughs> the very first thing he says, greetings, Timothy. Next sentence, command certain people not to teach false doctrine. Doctrine matters. Doctrine is important. We'd say, Paul, that sounds so divisive. Let's just all get along. Don't do the segmenting thing like that. Paul, don't go there. Why does he say that? I want us to be clear about this. False doctrine condemns. Right? We have to be very clear about that. False doctrine condemns, not because your pastor is a stick in the mud. Maybe I am, but that has nothing to do with it, right? False doctrine harms people eternally. And when Paul says, command people not to teach false doctrine, what are they supposed to answer it with? Right doctrine, right? 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, we talked about the tough parts about the role of males and females in the church, but 1 Timothy 2 also says this, he says, I urge then that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, to pray for all political leaders, whether we voted for them or not, right? To always pray for them. They have a tough job. Why should we pray for them? That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. There it is again, 1 Timothy chapter 1, command certain people not to teach false doctrine. 1 Timothy chapter 2, God wants all people to know what? The truth. The opposite of truth is error. And he says, I want people to know the truth. And then he gets right into what does he mean by the truth? For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. That's a doctrine. <laughs> that Jesus is the savior right jesus is the savior now the reason i want us to get that he says i want everybody to have right doctrine i want people to know the truth but the truth is that jesus christ is the savior jesus and nobody else right uh, that's the biblical witness that jesus is the one who was born of a virgin jesus is the one who heals the sick who raises the dead who preaches the gospel right jesus is the one who dies on the cross for the sins of the world, not any other philosopher, king, or artist. Jesus is the one who dies for the sins of the world, rises on the third day, ascends into heaven. How are you saved? Faith in him, right? I want us to get this. When we say doctrine, we want to be clear, faith has content, right? Faith has content. Something particular is believed. That's why doctrine is important. Now, uh, why do I want to dwell on that point? Um, I don't remember the name of the movie I was watching, but it was one of the bad Jesus movies. I hate to say this, but there are many bad Jesus movies. I'm not sure how they get it so wrong so much, but I don't remember the one, but I remember as clear as I can that Jesus was preaching to people and he says to everybody, you have to have faith. And they say, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, and I quote, he says, you have to have faith in faith. And I wanted to scream out, no, right? no, that is not the biblical definition of faith. Faith holds to Christ, right? When, he's, when we say you're saved by faith, we don't mean I trust that I have faith and my faith saves. No, my faith is that I trust in Jesus, right? Jesus is the Savior, faith in faith. What an awful doctrine. There's nothing biblical about that. We do not have faith in faith. We have faith in Christ, right? So I say faith has content, faith holds to that Christ, right? Which Christ? This one, the one revealed in scripture. So is doctrine important? Yes, command people not to teach false doctrine. I want all to know the truth, that Jesus is the savior. Chapter three, pastors and deacons and deaconesses. And chapter three ends with that wonderful poem, Jesus appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Doctrine. Doctor, Jesus, the Savior, God in the flesh, died and rose and ascended, right? Is doctrine important? Yeah, now that's all the first three chapters. 
this morning, Peggy read to us 1 Timothy chapter 4. Did you hear what she said? 1 Timothy 4, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. This is a pastoral epistle, Timothy being told by Paul, I want you to pastor the church. And what does Paul say? Confess rightly about Jesus, believe rightly about Jesus, and then he says the Spirit says that many will depart from the faith. It's, it's sad news. He's not saying it to rejoice, but he's again saying that faith has content, truth matters. Is our pastor a curmudgeon? That's not the point. <laughs> the faith matters, doctrine matters, to confess correctly matters, and false doctrine also has content and some people i want us to patch it he says some people follow the doctrine of demons now some people will say once you're saved you're always saved the bible never says that it says that some people will leave the faith that's possible to have been in the faith how did people leave the faith a step at a time right a step at a time jesus says a little leaven leavens the whole lump that's what we're always paying attention what do we teach what do we believe what do we confess is it biblical? Always examine what's the theology of what we're saying, what's the theology of what we're practicing. Does that make sense? Not to abandon the faith. Some will, don't, right? To confess the truth about Jesus and believe these things. Now, he goes on to say, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus. What he's saying is the danger is to leave the faith. The pastor's job is to warn people, right? Don't leave the faith. Be rooted in Christ. Be rooted in Christ. The Bible. Think theologically about what we're saying and doing, right? Does that make sense? To always evaluate when we, not what we, just what we teach and believe, but what we live and do is this consistent with Holy Scripture. Point these things out. Now he's going to say several other things. I want us just to note um, some stuff that gets said. In this text, there's a lot to say in the chapter, of course. We're going to have to, unfortunately, deal with the time issues, of course. So uh, verse 12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. I love that verse. By the way, I am not young, so the verse is not addressed to me. But verse 12, the reason he says don't let anyone look down on you because you're young is that some people, right, us old folks, sometimes think if somebody's young, they're not confessing the truth. This is the point. The truth is the truth, whoever says it, right? The truth is the truth, whoever says it. Timothy is young, he's going to challenge people in their thoughts and in their lives, and he's got to, by the way, not because the pastor is anything, but the, the, confessing the word of God, and he says, don't let people look down on you because you're young, just continue uh, to believe and confess the faith. Now, next thing I want to look at, verse 14, don't neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the elders laid their hands on you. Now, he's talking to Timothy in particular, but who has spiritual gifts in this place? All of us, if you have a gift, what are you supposed to do with it? Use it, right? That makes very good sense. If you have a gift, use it. Next verse, be diligent in these matters. Now, why does he say you have a gift, use it, be diligent? Why be diligent? Paul gets there's a lot of opposition to the news of Christ in the world. And so there's a tendency we would have to sometimes want to say, I should just give up, right? Who's ever been tempted to do that? It's a lot of hard right hard moving forward out there i'll just give up he, don't he says don't the truth is the truth of god in christ confess that truth be diligent in this matters give yourself wholly to them so everyone can see your progress progress means not perfect today but moving forward next verse and this is the one my pastor in virginia had in mind remember he said lifestyle is doctrine lived out listen to verse 16 watch your life and doctrine See, they go together. How shall we live? Again, sinners and stumble, of course, but that in general, we're trying to live and govern our lives in a biblical and scriptural way. Uh, watch your life and doctrine closely. Life and doctrine. The Bible uses the word doctrine right there. Watch your life and doctrine. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Does doctrine matter? The Bible urges right doctrine on us. Is false doctrine taught? Yes, and we're supposed to be aware of it. We're supposed to answer it. We're supposed to analyze it and point out where it's false. We're supposed to warn, right? To warn people to rescue them from eternal harm. Are we supposed to live it out? Watch your life and your doctrine closely. My pastor was right. 
lifestyle is doctrine lived out. Biblical doctrine, biblical theology. We're saved by Christ and by what he's done. It's revealed in the word. And what are we supposed to do now? Live it. Right? To live it out. To live. We've heard that there is a Christ. We've heard of what he's done. Now live as if that makes a difference. Right? Amen. And we stand together. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.